You know, the, uh, our president called for a, a national uh, day of prayer. And, and I got to tell you, it's kind of hard to get my head wrapped around all the things that have happened in the past couple of weeks. I mean, we've seen major sporting events being canceled. The ACC tournament, I can't believe it. It just breaks my heart. I, uh, of course, the NBA. I, I didn't even know they still had the NBA. I, that doesn't bother me one little bit. School closings. Um, a lot of people are worried about the, the kids that normally get breakfast and lunch at school. My goodness, what are they going to do? And how are the parents going to adjust to that? I mean, just there's a lot of things that are very concerning, isn't it, in, in our society today. And, and all of that's bad, but i got to be honest with you. The worst thing that's happened in these past two weeks is the cancellation of the Masters tournament. i got to tell you. <laughs> Nothing compares to that. I just can't imagine not being in Augusta in the springtime. But uh, nonetheless, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of fear, a, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry in, in the world right now. And, and I want to assure God's people, first of all, he's still on the throne. He's still in control, and we are in his hands. And he know this did not take our God by surprise. Um, God's people have always been called to a place of courage and not a place of fear. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1, the Bible says, Don't fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name, and you are mine. God actually commands us not to fear or worry. And the phrase, fear not, appears 80 different times in the Bible, most likely for two reasons. One, God knows that we have a propensity towards fear and anxiety, and he wants to constantly remind us that he is in control. And so we really don't need to be fearful. Uh, we don't need to be taken by this wave of anxiety that the world is going through. What we need to do as Christians is to be uh, a bright spot and uh, a light in this world of confusion out there today. You know, Jesus instructs his followers time and again to be free from fear and worry. And I think about Matthew uh, chapter 6, that wonderful Sermon on the Mount, where over and over again Jesus told us not to worry. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry. Look at the birds of the air. They don't worry. Uh, don't worry about uh, what you're to wear. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't worry. Why? Because God has a plan. God will take care of you. And I love that sentiment. God's still in, on his throne. You know, and that sentiment continues through uh, the New Testament. In Philippians chapter 4 and verses 6 through 7, the Bible says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful sentiment. And then 1 Peter uh, verses uh, chapter 5 and verses 6 says for us to cast all of our anxiety on him for he cares for us so if you're a little worried or you're a little concerned and certainly there is reason to be aware and concerned take those concerns bring them to the throne of God and leave them in his lap because he cares for you and so today uh, I don't know if you noticed on the marquee, I put it out there earlier this week, and uh, the title of today's message, ironically, is A Prayer for Draper. And I did not know that the president was going to call for a national day of prayer today. I put that sign up before that. But I do want us to pray today for our nation, and I want us to pray specifically today for Draper Christian Church. And in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul uh, has his second prayer, really, in this book. And he's praying for the church 
at Ephesus. And I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, and we're going to go through this prayer. And that's what this is. This is a recorded prayer from the Apostle Paul for the church at Ephesus. And at the end of this service, at the end of this message, I want us to have a special prayer for Draper Christian Church. I want you to notice how he begins this prayer. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. There was a purpose for this prayer of the Apostle Paul. The purpose of the prayer was born out of Paul's deep love and affection for the people at Ephesus. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you've got people in your life that you love and you care about, that you have a place to take those concerns and those cares uh, to the very throne room of God. As a Christian, you have the ability to come into the presence of God at any time you want and lift up a prayer for people that you love. And this was Paul's practice. He prayed uh, most intimately for this church at Ephesus. One of the beautiful examples of an intimate prayer is the prayer that Jesus prayed for the church in John chapter 17, and here's what he said. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it uh, amazing how God can take a, a service such as this, and I did not know what Tootie was going to be preaching on when he led us through the communion of the Lord's Supper. He was talking about unity. He was talking about unity in the church and fellowship in the church that begins with proper fellowship with God. And here we see that Jesus, when he prayed for the church, he prayed for unity in the church, that we may be one, that they, you, may be one as we are one, speaking of the Father and the Son. You know, Paul was a great missionary, he was a great teacher, but he was also a great man of prayer. And this is the second prayer in this book, as I mentioned. The first is recorded in the first chapter of Ephesians. We won't turn there, but I will share with you what he said there in Ephesians 1.16. I have not stopped giving thanks and remembering you in my prayers. You know, one of the greatest things we can do, if we want to be a thriving church, if we want to be a church that's impacting our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, where people are coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior, and then they're being saved by the blood of Christ, the greatest thing that we can do if we want to see that happen is to be a praying church daily, constantly be in prayer for one another, yes, but also for our community, uh, those outside of Christ Jesus, because we have something wonderful, don't we, to offer. And it's this love of God and it's this Savior that gave his life for us and it's this fellowship that is so sweet uh, as we come together. So there was the purpose of prayer and that purpose was that he had a deep affection and he wanted to come to the Father. I also, I, I also want you to notice the posture of his prayer. He says, I kneel before the Father. I kneel before the Father. This speaks of a, a humble posture before God. Now, I know as Christians, uh, we have um, been given this gift uh, because we are born-again believers and we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and we have uh, been filled with the Holy Spirit, we have this promise that we can go at any time with boldness before the throne. And, and I understand that, and I, and, I, and I think that's wonderful. But what we also need to remember is we need to have a posture of humility because when we go into the throne room of God, we are kneeling before the Creator of the universe, right? And so there ought to be some reverence and some awe as we come into the presence of God. And I noticed Paul, this great missionary, this great preacher of the gospel, his position or his posture in prayer is one of kneeling. 
I don't know, it's getting harder the older I get to, it's pretty easy to get down. <laughs> it's just a little tougher to get up anymore. But I think some of the closest times that I've had, and maybe you can um, affirm this as well, the closest times that I've had in my prayer life is when I've been on my knees before Almighty God. And there's just this sense of my recognition of His glory and His greatness and His majesty. And then, and then I just feel this warmth of knowing that God, the creator of the universe, is caring for me. And, and that comes through humility as we come and kneel before God. I remember when I was in Bible college visiting a church that was thriving. They were growing in leaps and bounds. They had an average of eight to ten baptisms every Lord's Day for a period of six months in a row. And so all of the students at, at RVC back then wanted to go and see what was happening. And so we would take field trips. A couple of us guys and sometimes some gals would go with us from RVC. And we'd go to, and visit this church to see what was happening. And it was amazing what was happening in this church. In this church... When they had a time of prayer before the church, everybody would be involved in it and they would be on their knees before the service. There was a group of people that would go from, from the sanctuary or the auditorium to the classrooms individually and in each classroom they would pray for the teacher and for the students that would be there. And then in the corporate setting when it came time for prayer, uh, and we, RBC students, weren't used to this. When it came time for prayer, the whole church got down on their knees and prayed. It's no wonder. I'm not saying that's the only reason that that church was growing and w reaching people with the gospel, but I got to tell you, I think it really helped, don't you? We need to be a praying church. There's something about being humble before Almighty God. And then there's the person of prayer. He says, I kneel before the Father. The prayer is directed to the Father. Now, most versions that I've seen have this addendum in them, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got a King James Bible this morning, that's what your Bible says, isn't it? The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we direct our prayer to the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, two people are praying. I'm praying, and Jesus is praying. You understand that? When I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, I'm not alone in the prayer. You see, there, that's intercessory prayer. Jesus said that if I, I go to the Father, it's good that I go to the Father, because he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And it's also good that he goes to the Father because he's seated at the right hand of God in the very throne room of heaven. And so when, when we pray, our prayers are carried to the throne room of God, and Jesus, because we belong to him, intercedes for us. We pray, and he prays. We ask for something, and Jesus asks God, the Father, on our behalf. It's a wonderful thing to have uh, this, this partnership with God and Christ in through prayer. In fact, John 16, 23 says, Very truly I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And so there's this partnership in prayer, this intercessory prayer by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's the, the period of prayer or the length of the prayer. Notice that this prayer is only seven verses long you know prayers don't have to be long to be effective now sermons do <laughs> sermons need to last a long long time to be effective no truly prayers do not have to be long to be effective in fact the lord said that we are not to use vain repetition as the heathen do they think they will be heard for their much speaking that's in matthew chapter 4 6 and verse 7. Moses, think about this. Moses' great prayer for Israel is recorded in only three verses. 
Elijah's prayer on Mount Carmel. Remember when Elijah was on Mount Carmel and he called down fire from heaven on the prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Baal were destroyed. Do you know that prayer is one verse long? It's a short prayer, but boy, did it have a pack. It, punched, uh, it, it, it packed a punch. And then the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. If you ever read that prayer, you can read the entire prayer in just three minutes. You see, prayers don't have to be long to be effective. I, I think about that church that I was telling you about that was a thriving church and a growing church. During the service, they had one person out of that prayer warrior group, that's, that was what they were called, that prayer warrior group, one person out of that group would go into a quiet place in the church, maybe one of these classrooms, and the entire time that the service was happening, after they'd already prayed for everybody in the church and every, all, the, all the Sunday school teachers and the preacher and all the people that were coming, after that would happen, one person would go into a room and they would pray and read Scripture the entire hour. So they'd pray a little bit, they'd read a little bit. They'd pray a little bit, they'd read a little bit. Sometimes I was told that sometimes they just were still in the presence of God. And they knew what, God knew what their prayer was. God heard them the first time. You don't have to tell them 101 times, right? Over and over again, he heard you. Sometimes they would just be still in the presence of God and God would move in the congregation. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful, wonderful truth that prayers don't have to be long to be effective. And then there's the p position uh, of prayer. I want you to look at verse 15 for just a minute. Notice what it says. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So we're a part of a, a, a big, big family, right? And if we're in Christ, we're in the church, and our position is in Christ. And that's the great truth of salvation. That's the, the high note, if you will, in the text that we who are in Christ are in a great, big, forever family. Now, you want to know something that I've noticed about families? Every family that I have come in contact with my entire life has a story. You know, families are messy, aren't they? And, and you know what? That's no different in the church. Uh, families are messy. Uh, the, in fact, there's a, there's a, a, a movement called Messy Church. And in uh, the messy church movement, what these, what these evangelists are, are realizing is, you know what, w we live in a, in a world, in a society where families are just, they're just train wrecks anymore, right? And, and we need to understand that going in, that when people come together in this society today, they bring a lot of problems and a lot of issues, a lot of challenges that, you know what, back in the 50s, maybe we didn't have, we've always had challenges in the church. But you know what, in this society today where it's moved away from God in our public forum and, and they've moved away from the Judeo-Christian uh, truths that we grew up on, the world is getting more and more messy. And so there's this movement called the Messy Church Movement and they just recognize that we live in a train wreck society with messed up lives. And what they understand going in is, you know what, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be smooth all the time as we try things and do things and reach out and develop programs. There's going to be bumps in the road. But you know what? As we're going to be the adults in the room. That's what the, the, the leadership team in those churches say. We're going to be the adults in the room. We're going to stay calm, cool, and collected. And you know what? God's in control. Everything's going to work out. They just recognize that church like it, a family, can be messy at times. May I say that really and truly, it's always been that way. Uh, there is no perfect church. If there was a perfect church, I couldn't be a member of it. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> right? And neither could you, because you're not perfect. None of us are. We come together with our stuff, and we love each other through it, okay? And that's what we're going to do at Draper Christian. I love the old hymn, Just As I Am. Don't you? Just as I am without one plea, but that 
thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am in waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And then, as we wrap up this, there is the petitions that he lays out for the church. And literally, there's four petitions in this prayer. And so let's take a look at verses 16 and following. I pray that out of his glorious riches, number one, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ, number two, may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp, that's knowledge, of how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So let's look at those four areas that Paul prayed for the church. The first thing that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus is that they would have strength, but not strength uh, through human understanding, not strength in physical power, but strength in the inner being, that spiritual strength. So Paul's going to pray uh, into this church that they would have power, that they would have strength in their inner being. That's spiritual strength, spiritual health. There have been a lot of prayers uh, for physical needs in the church. And you know what? We need to do that. Even Paul prayed that this thorn would be removed from his flesh several times in his ministry. So it's okay to pray for the physical needs of people. But most importantly is that we pray for the inner being, that spiritual strength for our people in the church. And then Paul prays for faith in verse 17, as we saw. Christ, that, that Christ may dwell in their hearts, that we may think the thoughts of Christ and feel for others as Christ feels for them. That's what it means. When, when Christ comes to dwell in your life, you begin to take on his image. And you begin to see things like Christ sees things. You begin to see people like Christ sees people. I'm so grateful that he, he allows me to see that, you know what, this person might be acting kind of unbecomingly right now, but there's something that happened in their life somewhere long before. And maybe they're acting out right now in a certain way, but you know what, because Christ dwells in me, I have this peace. And I can let that stuff just roll off. I need to let it roll off. You need to let it roll off if we're going to get along, right? But we need to understand that when Christ comes to dwell in our lives, we have this new position for Christ to dwell in us. That's our uh, possession. So we have a position in Christ. Those of us who uh, are in Christ in the church, we have a position. But then we also have a possession because not only are we in Christ, Christ is in us us and that's a beautiful thing and when he's in us we begin to change and act differently accordingly and then finally uh, or next there's the knowledge and what he wants us to know is how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ the love of Christ is wide it reaches around the world it's long he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world it's deep it's so deep that God's love reached down to the cross of Jesus Christ and it's so high that God's love reaches from the cross to heaven itself where Jesus anxiously awaits for the Father to say, Son, go get my children. And then there's the fullness, finally, the fullness. And that means that we want all of the fullness and the blessings of God through Christ to live in our lives. You know, the sister uh, letter to this book of Ephesians is Colossians. And here's what Colossians 2.9 says. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives bodily. So Jesus is God. And then it goes on in verse 10. And in Christ, you have been brought 
to fullness. And so everything that we need to be a thriving, growing, reaching church is in Christ. And if Christ is in us, we have everything that we need. I'm going to close this out with a prayer for Draper. And then uh, we're going to have an invitation time. And I, there may be, are there people waiting in the wing out there right now? Are they? All right. Well, if you bring them on in, I'm going to go ahead and have a prayer. And then we're going to have an invitation time. Okay? So let's pray for Draper. Father God, my prayer for Draper Christian Church echoes Paul's prayer in Ephesians. I pray that each member would be strengthened spiritually in their inner being. I pray that the love of Christ and faith in him would take root in their hearts and minds, that Christ would truly come to take up permanent residence in their lives. I pray that each member would grow in knowledge of the width, the depth, and the height of God's love for them in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.